guys, Brandon here. Hope you're all having uh, a good day. <sighs> I would be practicing So I get quite a few questions for piano tips, so I thought I would make this first video, hopefully there'll be more to come, but it was more to do with general guidelines and tips for efficient piano practice, and I've listed it into things we should be doing and things we shouldn't be doing. So I put it as a five do's and five don'ts. The do's and don'ts of piano practice. So we'll start with the things we should be doing, I think. So the first thing we should be doing is practicing methodically and practicing smartly. But if we could start with simply even the structure of how you practice, we want to be doing things like allocating the time efficiently. So I would recommend that whatever time you're using, you allocate one third of that to scales and sight reading your foundations and then the last uh, portions, the two thirds to your repertoire. So I'm speaking strictly from a classical approach. I suppose if you were a jazz player or playing pop music, you'd still be using one third of it for foundation. So I think everyone really needs to learn their, their scales and music theory through learning the scales. And then maybe instead of sight reading, if you're playing by ear, then you spend 10 minutes playing by ear somehow, maybe listening to pop songs on the radio, figuring out the basic four chord progressions that are in a lot of pop songs, and then trying to play by ear. And then you use the rest of the time for your, your repertoire or whatever you're doing. But at least from the classical viewpoint, I could definitely say that scales and sight reading for your foundations, one third of the time, and then repertoire. So if it's an hour, 10 minutes on scales, 10 minutes on sight reading, and then the rest on repertoire. That's what I do uh, when I'm usually practicing. So you can scale that to two, three, four, five hours, whatever. Maybe if it's getting that far though, you wouldn't spend that much time on scales and sight reading, I suppose, but who knows. But so that's one for practicing methodically or organizing your practice methodically. So if you're an adult learner and you've got work, possibly 10, 20 minutes in the morning, can you do your scales and our Peggio's in the morning, sight reading in the morning with breakfast <laughs> and then um, or you know just before work if you've got time do you get breaks do you come back home 10 minutes here 10 minutes there and then when you come back from work you can do an hour of dedicated practice possibly or half an hour whatever you have time for that's what I did when I was still working as a personal trainer I would do it a little bit in the morning and then uh, the majority in the evening or if I had a gap because I was self-employed, so the times would be different. Number two is to practice slowly. So I think a lot of these tips, to be honest, are kind of obvious, but a lot of people, including myself, you just forget. In the, in the midst of practicing, we forget to do these things. So practicing slowly is key to making sure that these pieces come out refined and polished, essentially. If we're speeding up the tempo, I think the tempo should be the almost the final thing. And I feel like you can play around with the tempo all the time. So even when you have it at performance standard, you want to be playing it slowly, uh, working through sections of difficulty, playing them at speeds that you can control. So for example, when I learned the, um, the Rachmaninoff piece, learn this piece I wasn't playing it at the speed I'm playing it at now obviously so I think when I eventually got it to a speed that I could play from beginning to end it sounded more like It's 
eventually got it to, but you always want to be playing at a speed that you can control. And because when things are going too fast, you're not, the muscle memory is taking over, you're not really digesting the music anymore, you're just kind of letting your fingers fly. But to get those nuances and the details that we want in our playing, we have to do them slowly. So <clears throat> make sure that you're always practicing slowly from the very beginning. Three is to record yourself and listen to online recordings. So the easiest way for us to kind of improve our own playing without a teacher on our own is just to simply record ourselves. A lot of the times when we're playing, what we're hearing isn't usually, um, it's not always accurate. <laughs> so a lot of the times we think we sound better than we actually do. And then we put on a recording, uh, we record ourselves and we see that oh, maybe my, my melody isn't singing out as much as I want to, or my bass is too heavy, or something sounded a bit off. That way, you, you don't even need a teacher, you become your own teacher. Obviously, a teacher is not going to be there every, every day, unless, you know, in some cases, in most cases. So we need to record ourselves to sort of analyse how we sound, and we can compare those to recordings. So... We've got so much easy access to online recordings of music now. You know, back in the day, people had to go to music stores and try and find a couple of recordings of a piece that they're learning, maybe, to get ideas. Now we have instant access to thousands of artists playing the pieces that we want to learn or for us to analyse the music, see how people play them in different ways. So listen to as many recordings as you can. I take that to your advantage. I don't agree with the people that say that. Don't listen to recordings and find your own voice. I mean, start, gather all the resources that are available to you in this current age and listen. But then maybe once you get it to a level of performing for yourself, then you start to stop listening to recordings and you start creating your own sound. But to initially start, you can speed up to so much time if you just listen to recordings. So. That's that. And then number four of things we should be doing is taking advantage of all the online resources. So especially if you're a self-taught player, you need to be using all the online resources available. So during my first five to six months of playing, I was searching a lot online like crazy for as much information as I could find and learning a lot that way. I mean, there's amazing resources that can take you up to such a high level on your own just through online resources. I feel like unless you're quite lucky and good at self-teaching yourself, there's a lot of things that you're gonna miss out on if you don't eventually get some tutoring or occasional tutoring. So even myself with my um, university piano teacher, I still use these videos as supplementary tools and together with the teacher, that's how I feel my progression goes the greatest because I'm learning even outside of lessons so people like josh wright piano tv um paul barton and uh, graham fitch just off the top of my head those are the people that i learn a lot from they have piano tutorials on pieces and their approach specific general um practicing methods especially graham fitch and josh wright they're kind of owning that area of uh the online YouTube piano world and online piano world is by giving you know tips from advanced to intermediate to beginner. They have their own master classes. They have their own kind of tutorials for people that are from the very beginner all the way up to advanced. So even now, specific things that are very advanced, I'm I can learn from online resources that are completely free or quite cheap. So make sure that you're using online resources and always trying to gather more knowledge. And number five thing to do, I think this is overlooked, but make sure that you're sitting properly and your, uh, your posture. So if we're, you know, if we're sitting like this for hours, that's just terrible, isn't it? And you know, I see that, you know, the people that are playing like this, it just looks awful. But if we can first sit straight and then have our arms so that when we're playing, our elbows are nice and straight. We don't want it to be too high 
or too low, unless you're Glenn Gould or Vladimir Horowitz, then you can do what you want, I suppose. But at least start with the foundations of like this. So keeping your arms close to your sides, arms straight here and close to the key bed. If you want to have a good starting place for your hands, I think Paul Barton said it as well, you can cup your, your knee and then without changing your hand position, put that on the piano to get a rough idea of what your hand should be doing. So they don't have to be perfectly curved like this. Some people have longer hands or, you know, slender fingers. They're going to have to be a bit more stretched out. But as long as you feel supported, that's the most important thing. I would recommend recording yourselves for how to sit properly and just make sure that you are sitting with good posture. So those are all things I would say to definitely do. And things to not do is first off, not practice brainlessly. So always have a clear goal in mind. So from the very beginning of practicing when we're learning the piece, analyzing what's difficult, what's going on in the music and not just going from beginning to end over and over and over again. So like, for example, I'm getting this piece uh, by Chopin, uh, the Nocturne A, A flat, uh, A flat major. starting to be able to get it to a level where I can play through fairly closer to the performance tempo I want. I know there's still a lot of issues going on where things aren't fully secure. So instead of just playing through the beginning to end thinking, oh, this is nice and then getting stuck on the same bit, I try and go deep into those issues. So especially the middle section that has a lot of um, chromaticism and um, slowly and I'm giving the most amount of attention to that section so I'm not just playing through from beginning to end over and over I'm really um, looking at what needs to be worked on the most and that goes on to the second thing I would avoid doing which kind of goes hand in hand with this is to stop avoiding trickier sections so if you keep slipping up on the same thing go and correct it don't skip it and then just hope that it fixes itself even if you get to a bit where it's difficult, I don't know, like um, if that bit, that quick bit in this nocturne, if it's giving me, if it's not 100%, then instead of going to the beginning and then coming back to this bit, just literally start at it, start at that point. I'm sorry about the piano, it's out of tune, but that's not really an excuse. No, so always paying attention to the tricky sections, highlighting those and putting the most amount of time on those. There's another bit, like in the Mozart um, piano sonata, like um it's now getting to a point where it's close to performance level or at least playing through without you know playing through it it still has loads of uh work to improve on for sure but this bit um towards the end of the first section <laughs> on that because a lot of the times my left and right hand would not sync up and I was trying to figure out what exactly was the issue and really paying attention to my left hand playing with rhythms I'd try and 
trying to solve the issue as opposed to playing through it and then getting to this bit, maybe getting it half right, but not sounding quite in sync and then just continuing. I stop, uh, I might play it through it, and then when I get to that point and I realize there's an issue, then I start working on it straight away. So don't skip tricky sections, make sure that you're working on it. Um, third don't would be to not over pedal. So I think as beginners, as soon as we realize that the pedal makes a beautiful sound, we just kind of start using it straight away. But I know some people say that you should pedal very from the very beginning when you're learning a piece of music, but I think if it's not secure, then you can start to hide things with the pedal by accident, at least for me, with especially with romantic with the romantic repertoire so i would learn without the pedal to make sure that it's secure first before moving on to adding the pedal so for example that that nocturne i wish i didn't put the shuffle back on so it's the left hand has to be very legato but without the with the pedal it sounds okay but what I, what I was doing was going but really I want to be trying to maintain the legato line with as much of my hand as I can without hiding it with the pedal because it still comes through so I might practice just without the pedal as possible before adding in the pedal. So that's how I'm at least approaching things, especially with this middle section here. Um, playing is secure in my hands. Because as soon as you add the pedal and you can hide things, you might not mean to do it, but you might start making mistakes. So until I feel that this section is secure and I'm playing correctly with the right articulation and legato line, I won't add the pedal in. So I'm only now getting to a point where I'm trying to experiment with adding the pedal for this section of the Chopin. So, don't over pedal. A key as well is to remember to always try and clear it every time there's a bass change. So now, sorry, I should say short. Now, now, because if I didn't. there's a bass change is usually a good rule of thumb at least to start and in contrast to that make sure that you're not pedaling or over pedaling earlier music like Mozart or Baroque, Bach, stuff like that. So make sure to practice first without the pedal I think at least until you feel that it's fully secure and then you can add the pedal in. Okay number four Okay, so this is a big one to not do is not play pieces above your level. So I feel, well, that's rich coming from me because I played, tried to play fancy impromptu in the first year and it wasn't perfect. And to be honest, that was um, above my level because no matter how much slow practice I was doing, there were just uh, technical limitations because I wasn't fully developed really. So I feel like it was never going to be, the performance level was never going to be very good. So. I definitely took a step back in my approaches, especially when going to uni and going through the ABRSM grade system to try and build my 
playing as a whole, being more well-rounded, so having good technical control of all the scales and arpeggios to start, doing sight reading, and then playing repertoire. So, you know, people that are saying, I've played for six months now and I've learned, I'm learning Le Campanella and I'm learning Chopin's first full art, it's like, why? Because <laughs> it's going to take you years, likely, and you're not going to be able to play it as beautifully as you want it to so because there's limitations to your level at that point so I could probably have started learning the ballad at the end of my first year and then be playing it now but would I be playing it as well as I'd want to no it'd be probably be nowhere near as good as I want it to be it's probably better it is better to play things at a level that I'm comfortable with that challenges me and builds me musically um, and prepares me for that stuff. So I'd rather wait a few more years and then approach the ballad knowing that I could learn it in a few months or under a year and play it well than to only be learning one piece because it's so difficult and that's the only thing I can focus on. Like, that's the easiest way of getting burnt out. So definitely try and play things at your level and not above your level. It's hard to know what that is if you're self-taught, but most people shouldn't be uh, learning uh, something like Liszt in their the Campanella in their first year, I don't think. Um, I mean, if your goals are just to, you really just want to play that piece, then go for it. And especially if you don't want to play it at like a concert tempo, if you're just trying to play it slowly, or like things, small sections from advanced pieces of music, like the chromatic thing. <laughs> Like using weak fingers, that's in um, Chopin's second etude. That's useful, but if you were trying to play something at like a performance level, uh, make sure that it's something that you can digest. So I think easier works of music you can learn in a few days, a week, week or two. Stuff that's at your level is probably approaching the months. So for me, for example, I've been able to learn all of the Mozart sonata, the first movement. Uh, of K330 in about a month, uh, just over a month, because it's now the 21st of December, and I started to learn it just after my exam, so mid-November, and now I'm getting it to the point where I'm trying to commit it to memory and solidify it. So that piece has taken me like between one and three months, so I think that's a good range. I'd say that music at this, at your level, would probably take upwards of two months, two to six months. If it's a big project, it might take a year, but I think anything over a year, you know, you're wasting your time really. Like the grade eight ABRSM pieces, I learned those, like the Rachmaninoff I learned maybe, I could play through it after about three, four months, but it wasn't at a performance level or until another further two to three months, for example. So. Make sure that you're taking on pieces that are of your level. You can use ABRSM if you're going through the grades as a good guide. Though I know that some people are technically advanced to play pieces that even though they can't sight read at that level. But that's why I think it's important to kind of be all well round anyway. Because you want your foundations to be strong because if you're approaching harder and harder repertoire and there's gaps in your knowledge of your foundation, then things are going to fall apart easier. Uh, I also like to use the Henley system, so they have a, a, a level from 1 to 9. 1 to 3 is easy, 4 to 6 is medium, and then 7 to 9 is difficult, so different grading. So I believe everything that I'm kind of playing around right now is about 6 to 7 in difficulty. So I know for myself that 6 to 7 on the Henley system is probably where I am right now. Maybe I could stretch it, but what good would that be? And I know that uh, difficulty is so subjective because there's some things that are harder than others, like this Chopin Nocturne I'm finding quite difficult, not because so much of the notes, but playing with legato and holding things down. So there's a lot of things where you have to sustain and not let go. where the difficulties are coming in from the nuances but that's what I have that's my opinion on difficulty
sorry about the uh, the slight tangent there, but don't be wasting a year of your time learning one piece. Just learn music that get through lots of repertoire and build your musicality, and then approach that when you can do it in a much shorter amount of time. There's no rush. Though that's rich because we all want everything, everything straight away. I know, even myself, but try to avoid that as best you can. And then last thing is don't compare yourself to others. So I think as adult beginners, we all suffer from this a lot because we're seeing what young prodigies have been doing and where we are at and we're like, oh, bloody hell, I want to be there. And that's kind of partly why we play pieces above our level because we want to we want to be there already. We're not like the five-year-old that started and was just playing for fun and then naturally got there. We want, we want to speed up because we know that we started late and that's definitely true, but... You have to pull back the reins and know, know what you are, you know, you can only do so much in a short period of time. Uh, I feel like a, such a hypocrite saying that because of my own progress, but I suppose you have to be honest with yourself and know what you're capable of and base your ambitions based off that. So if it's taking you one year to get to the Bach Minuet, or something very basic, or get to like... I can barely play anymore, but if, uh, you know, if you got there in a certain amount of time, be realistic of where you're going next, you know what kind of level that is at. You're not going to go from that to sky high. You have to do things in between to link it over. Um, try to look for the for people for inspiration possibly use me as an example of what can be done with a lot of hard work and a bit of luck maybe <laughs> um and that's why i feel obliged to i want to continue to document my progress but not in like the one year progress video sort of way but just to show people what i'm doing that you know i was one of these youtube uh progress videos that obviously lives for piano now, but started from the bottom and worked extremely hard and has consistently made progress, you know. I went, uh, hopefully, you know, as I continue to go through the years, I continue to progress consistently, but realistically, you know. So anyway, those are my do's and don'ts. I hope they were helpful. Um, I will do another like video like this, but for Q and A's. So if you guys have questions, keep asking them because I've put a list of questions that some of you have, and I'm going to make a separate video on them at another occasion. But for now, I hope that has been helpful and I'll see you guys soon. Have a great Christmas and take care. Bye.